Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Access. Because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, clear communication is of the utmost importance. Life Saving Systems Corporation. We do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. And SR3 Rescue Concepts. Because you don't know what you don't know. Breeze Eastern. They dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. Dot com. The Axness PNG wireless ICS system can bring cutting edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere at any time on any aircraft. Plus, with the strongest and most robust waterproof handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1,800 public safety, air ambulance, and search and rescue aircraft worldwide. I have personally used the Axness system in four different countries and on five different airframes. It is awesome. If you want more information, contact them today at axnes.com. That's A X N E S.com. You just make sure you tell them Quinny sent me. Life Saving Systems Corporation. They manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From my favorite harness as a rescueman, the Triton harness, to the rescue baskets, the litters, and of course, the most popular hook in all helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSE will cut, bend, sew, weld, and machine these products into existence every day. We do our work so you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at Rescue Gear. That's at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R. And SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help with your helicopter training, a standardization and safety check, or maybe just an audit or an FAA refresher. They are here to bring your agency up to date with the most current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is awesome. With a certified flight instructor pilots, experienced crew members, which I am happy to say that I am one of them, they offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operations, and night vision goggle use. SR3 is also partnered with Petzl to assist with personal protective equipment and the highly specific Lazard. SR3 also goes beyond the helicopter world as they provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com or over on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. Up next, we've got more amazing stories coming to us from Ireland. CHC and the Irish Coast Guard, they never cease to amaze me with some of the stuff that those guys do. So please welcome our next guest, Mr. Keith Carolyn. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is 
The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Real Rescue Podcast. Today I've got with me another brother of ours from uh, Ireland, Irish Coast Guard, Winchman, uh, Winch, wait a minute, uh, how'd it go? It went Winchman, Winch Winch Operator, operator. and then Paramedic, and Star God. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) 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 You know what? That's for everybody else in Ireland that has to work with you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jake. Yeah, yeah. I told you to leave that part out, you know. You I don't know. There's I, like too many star gods on here, you know. I don't know what you're talking about. It it must have been a delay or something. Or you you cut out for a second and <laughs> leave that part out. What? Uh, Keith, thank you so much for coming on. I I'm very much looking forward to talking to you. Um, you and I have been in communication actually for gosh, almost a couple of months now and trying to set this up. So the fact that we are here now, I am I am totally pumped. So welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Jason. As you know, we, yeah, we have been in contact with each other. I've been trying to avoid it a small bit and then got, got into it. But yeah, really, really love it. Really love what you do. And as I said to you earlier on, yeah, the people that you have on, uh, it's the people that you have on that may get convinced me to come on to it because they're, they're so good, you know, the they, 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 they mix of people. The, the variety of jobs they do, you know, somebody somebody had to do this, and I think you're the ideal guy for it because you just have the right, you have the right balance of everything, you know. You you've been there, you've done that. You have the t-shirts, you have the badges and patches, and uh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Really, really, really happy. You know, thanks very much for inviting me. I really, oh, really appreciate it. Kid me, it's my pleasure, man. I, I I'm totally stoked. Like you said, I mean, you and I have been talking for so long. It's it's about damn time. That's all I'm going to say to that. All right, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, Keith. So for everybody else that doesn't know you, if you don't mind, just give a little bit of an uh, introduction to us, a um, little bit of background about who you are and how you got into search and rescue. Okay, no problems. Uh, as Jason said, my name is Keith Carolyn. I'm old. <laughs> I'm a married man with two kids. <laughs> I live in Dublin in Ireland. Um, my career started when I joined the Defence Forces, the Irish Defence Forces. In 1987, um, and to everyone's surprise, I went into the medical corps. I served in the Irish Medical Corps for as a combat medic for about seven, seven and a half, eight years before I was, um, what would you call it, uh, waylaid into SAR and when I moved to the Irish Air Corps uh, from the Defence Forces. But it's, I did about eight years in, in search and rescue in the Air Corps, flying in the uh, Alouettes and Alouette Tree and the Dolphins. Um, and then I took a career change and I joined Dublin Fire Brigade as a professional firefighter paramedic. Oh, I nice. Spent, I spent 12 good years with Dublin Fire Brigade until I was brought back to the dark side of search and rescue. Um, and I moved <laughs> back to work for CHC Ireland, um, who are contracted to the Coast Guard uh, to supply search and rescue in Ireland. I uh, flew S61s initially. And then when we upgraded to the 92, I upgraded to 92 as well. I've been working here for... Close to 10 years, uh, eight of those years was out of the Waterford base with Rescue 117. And the last two years have been with Rescue 116 in the Dublin base. So Nice. So, uh, yeah, you know what? Actually, that, that brings up a kind of a question for me. Like, And I follow you guys on Facebook. As far as the Irish Coast Guard and stuff, you guys have. So it's 115, 116, 117, 118. Yep. And 119. Is there five oh. of them? No, no, there's only four of them. Um, oh, four, okay. Five aircraft, but when the spare aircraft comes in, it it, it, it takes up the call sign of the base it goes to. So the bases are, we've got 115 in Shannon, 116 in Dublin, okay. 117 in Waterford, and 118 up in Sligo up in the northwest. Yeah. Got it. So, so they're, they're, basically they're, all four corners of all four corners Ireland. of Ireland are covered by the, by the heavens, yeah. And, and you guys cross paths all the time. You're yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we do shifts. We do overtime shifts in the base. I mean, yeah. we, 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 if one of the aircraft's offline or one of the aircrafts out doing the job, we've gone to another patch. You know, we're very familiar with each other's patch. Ireland's nice. a small enough country, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, we can we can cover almost anywhere in the country in about, I'd say, an hour or so in the country, you know. Yeah, how nice. you get there, you know. So, it's, yeah, it's good. It's small, compact. A yeah. nice group. There's only, at the moment, there's, there's, 30, there's 32 rear crew, uh, technical crewmen um, in the company. So, and it's always was small. In the air corps, when we were in the air corps, we had a small band of 22 of us, you know. Oh, wow. The defense forces, yeah. So it was a small, small sort of elite unit of 22 people who did, who did the job in, 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 the, in the Air Corps. And we didn't consider ourselves elite, but 
um, we liked it. You know, we were flying in little alouette trees and then the dough fans, single engine to double engine, you know. Yeah. Uh, alouette had a had a pneumatic hoist with 70 40 cable. <laughs> which is what? Like, oh, it. man. Yeah. And then you went to a dough fan, which is twin engined and 120 for the cable, you know? Yeah. So you're you're almost doubling your length of cable. Yeah. And then to to the S sixty ones and S ninety twos, which are super aircraft, super oh. modern aircraft, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Man, that's that's awesome. What you've had an incredible career and still going, I might add. I'm just gonna throw yeah. that out there. Like, yeah. Can't yeah, hold the good man down, good. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm not the crap. My knees are still good. My hips are still good. So I'm still fighting the good fight. You know, I'm still yeah. out there doing it. Listen, <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm going as long as I possibly can. Right? When my body says no, my mind is still going to say, you can do it. Don't yeah. quit. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 you know, it's mind over matter. You know, your mind tells you that your body doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, that's great. Yeah. All right. So in this uh incredible career that you've got going on so all right defense force first you know and you're you're doing all the defense stuff and then you get into a little bit of search and rescue uh or firefighting right did i get that right so you went search and rescue and then firefighting yeah okay so do you remember your very first case before sarah case yeah i do i do I tell you what it was. Um, I was the, I, I was in a class of five that joined at that time, and it was the most amount of recruits that made it through uh, training. And uh, I was the last one to pop me cherry. The guys were doing SARS. First one of the guys, the first day on SARS, he got a job like that. He got two jobs, in fact. It took me four <laughs> took took me four months to break my cherry. Um, I did a job. There's a place here in, in Wicklow, in the Wicklow Hills, the Wicklow Mountains, called Glen the Lock, and uh, it's an old monastic site dates back to 1600s and uh, it's a very popular site for walk. It's very accessible. Um, it was February and we were scrambled out to a call that there were two French girls uh, hypothermic in the snow um, on one side of uh, Glendalough above Kevin's bed. It's a, it's an altitude of about 1,300 feet, you know, and the, what makes it so good up there is the bus drops you down into the, the bottom of the lake and, and the, it's a loop walk of about 19 kilometers. It takes about five hours or so, you know? Okay. Very, very accessible. Very, very accessible. But these two girls, they um, they weren't dressed for the conditions. Um, they had sunshine in the car park and they'd snow up on the top of the... On the yeah, it changes so quickly up in the hills up there. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So they went up with their jeans, their T-shirts and ordinary jackets on and sneakers, as you'd say in the States, or runners, as we call them here. And they walked up and they got caught in the snow at the highest point of the of the of the glen. And uh, they took shelter, but they were they the shelter wasn't good enough for them, they couldn't get back down. And a, a lone walker came across them. And Mount Risky was in his infancy at that stage in Ireland. Uh, so he had a, no mobile phones. So he had to turn around, go back two hours, get to a phone down to the ranger station. Holy scrambled us. We flew up. Um, I'd been on, I'd been doing hems jobs up to that, and I'd been on a couple of SAR shows where we were stood down. So I was, I was, I was excited. I was, I was like a puppy with a new toy, you know. I was going, yeah, I'm going to do it. This is it. This is it. <laughs> and then we flew into snow showers. I was going, shit, I'm going to have to go to the snow. <laughs> like, <laughs> my language. It's going to be cold out there. I better start getting the kit on, the proper kit on. So I was putting on the heavy weather kit, and I was, um, so we got up there, and anyway, we, we. The guy had said that he, he left them with a survival bag. Uh, he'd given them hats and gloves. So we were trying to spot the orange survival bag. And uh, we'd be done a little recce. Done, uh, the winch operator that was with me was a guy called Dick Lynch. And the pilot was Dave Flaherty. God rest his soul. Dave passed away in the Dauphin crash in 1999 mm. in Tremor. And he was one of the pilots. Very, very nice man. Very good pilot. Dick was in there. Dick was one of them salty winch operators, you know. Yeah. Has done it all, seen it all, you know. This is only another rescue to him, you know, although top of his game totally. Um, so so between us, we found him. And anyway, and Dick says, this is going to be a winch, Keith. And I was going, yes, yes. Inside, I was going, yes, yes, yes. I've got a winch. I've got to do a rescue. Uh, and outside, I was, I was Mr. 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 Silverman. Yeah. You know, hey, you got to keep cool. You got to keep cool. Come on. Yeah, I, can, I can do this, Dick. I'm a professional. Yeah, I'm really professional. I can do this, Dick, you know. So, <laughs> so down I went. Took an initial assessment of the two girls, decided that, yeah, they were going to the hospital. Um, so winched the two of them into the aircraft, small little alouette, remember, it's a tiny little aircraft. Got them into the aircraft, and then Dick being Dick, um, 
I was the new guy. I was the I was trained up the EMT level at that stage. So so Dick just sort of sat in front of the aircraft, looking out in front of the aircraft, and left all the patient treatment to me. <laughs> so I, I I basically I, I did what I had to do, you know, took off the wet clothes, wrap them up in flecked around blankets, wrap wrapped them up in um in dry blankets uh, as much as I could, put them both into survival bags. We had a pro pack at that stage, no de- no defibrillators so the pro pack. I was trying to get BPs off, I was trying to get pulse off, I was trying to get uh, temperatures off them. Um, got them to the hospital and then we dropped them at the hospital. Uh, dropped them in, dropped them into St. Vincent's Hospital. It was a helipad in St. Vincent's at that stage. Came back to the base. And, um, well, not that I was expecting high fives all over the place, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, I go back to the base and there was nobody there. <laughs> I couldn't tell any any of the guys that were in cars at you know, that you know done my first job. Uh, could no mobile phone. I couldn't ring my wife. So that evening I didn't. I didn't tell my wife that evening. It was a twenty four hour duty. So the next day I got home and she says to me, "Well, how did your day go?" I said, "Cool and calm with a cup of tea." You know, yeah, I did a rescue yesterday. Two two French girls off playing the lock. You know, and she goes, "Really?" And I went. Yeah. It was amazing, <laughs> <laughs> and I was hugs and high fives and kisses and yeah, and that that and to this day, to tell you the truth, I couldn't tell you what those two girls looked like. I couldn't tell you what they were wearing. I couldn't tell you anything about it. I just thought that, that that was my first job, and and you're two twenty year old French students, and I was I was only young as well. I was I was twenty seven or twenty eight at the time. Couldn't tell you anything about them. Nothing. Couldn't even. I couldn't even tell you what height they were, what they looked like. Nothing. I was just so thrilled to get a star job done. It was woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and, 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 and look, it was Alouette one nine seven. Uh, that was his call. So that was it. That 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 was the the the, the tail number of it. And we were rescue one one zero. And uh, that when he stood down the Alouettes. There a couple of years ago in the air car, I was up there and I got my photograph taken with the helicopter before it went away. Um, uh, they, they all, most of the Alouettes were, were were sent to museums and stuff like that. But yeah, one nine seven always had a place in my heart after that. You know, it was my aircraft as I considered it. So, oh, yeah. that's awesome! Yeah. <laughs> what a good case too, because it's like it, it's that it's 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 what we do and why we do it. The outcome came out all right and. To, to, to even think about those girls, so those girls hiked up. They you figure they got about it took about two hours, two and a half hours to get to up to location. Yeah. They get all cold, trying to hunker down. They had to wait for somebody to show up, which was a two hour hike for them. Then yeah. them to hike two hours back yeah. down. Then yeah. to alert you guys. Then you guys fly up. Oh, they were up there for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Only, only for the only for the guy came across and I'd say they would have passed away. You know they would they would have they would have died of hypothermia. But well, quite a heavy snowfall um came and February it's February so yeah you get snow in Ireland in February you know they 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 were Erasmus students so they were all students so they rode for a couple of months and uh they 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 didn't know the area they didn't know what they were doing they didn't know the conditions could change so quickly but the walker walked that loop every day so he knew so he had his backpack on he had he had his he had his equipment he he gave them. He actually he had they put the two of them into one survival bag. They were they were slim little girls. Yep. Uh, he gave them extra hats, he gave them gloves, he gave them food, he gave them um, his hot coffee to drink, you know what I mean? He wrapped them up, he put them in a position where he told us exactly where they were, both Kevin's bed. Um, everybody knows Kevin's bed in uh in everyone uh, everyone who goes sorry, everyone ever walk in Glenda Lock. Uh, everyone who was ever in the military knows knows where Kevin's bed is in Glenda Lock, you know. Yeah. So that's where we were, they opened Kevin's bed and and he walked back down and got to the ranger station, rang us. And we, we in the Alouette, we were only gone to dusk, Sar as well. We didn't do night stuff, you know. Oh, didn't do night okay. Stuff Sar. Yeah, until we got to Dolphin, we didn't do night stuff. So, yeah. So, the Alouette, so you so guys we, are actually on the clock. Like, you're pushing oh, yeah. Yeah, to get up there before time. nighttime. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Pushing for him. Yeah, yeah. Dang, man. So that was, that was my fourth one. And, and you know... They say you always remember your force and yeah, you do. I remember my first ambulance case in the in 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 in, in the fire brigade as well. Uh, that was that, that hadn't got such a good outcome, and that'll always stick with me as well, you know. Um I remember, all my years. First fire, remember my first fire in the fire brigade as well. That 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 was a that that was a good fire. <laughs> That's all I say. Okay. The house fire, domestic fire, and me being the young lad, of course, I was told, in you go, you know, get your BA set on, you're going. Shoot to the kitchen, the fire's in the kitchen. You had to fight into the kitchen from the, from the front of the house into the kitchen. 
knock the fire down, ventilate, all that. And that was, I was four fighting stuff, you know. The first ambulance case I did was, that didn't have a good outcome, was, um, it was a sudden infant death. Um, so, a young guy had, 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 um, had a cardiac arrest, a child, a two-year-old child. Ouch. And that, that wasn't a good outcome. So, That's... yeah, so, so, so they, they, they're my first three cases in, in different jobs, like, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, look, that, that's the way it goes. That's when your career is, when you've got a diverse career. And even search and rescue, Jason, I didn't want to do search and rescue. I, I, I know you know this. I know you told you, but I didn't tell you the story. I'm going to tell you the story now, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, when I was a recruit in the Defence Forces, I was trained by a guy called Dave Carlin, right? He changed his name later on. He, he, gave, his, he gave his Gaelic name of Dahi O'Connor Lauren, right? And because his surname was Carlin and my surname was Carlin, the first word out of his mouth when he wanted somebody to do was recruit Carolyn. That was me. Recruit Carolyn? Recruit Carolyn? Recruit Carolyn? <laughs> so we have a saying here that he rode me like a Blackpool donkey, right? You know, you know the donkeys on the beach, yeah, they get work like so that that's what happened to me during recruit training. But I was oh. fit. I was flying fit. I was um I was a savage fit recruit. My fitness dropped in the first six weeks of military training, believe it or not. So he always kept annoying me. And uh, I stayed friends with him. We were good friends. Um, he was training me for special forces. He was next special forces soldier. And he, we, he was training me for special forces, for the special forces selection. When I broke my leg playing soccer, um, I, I broke my leg in five places playing soccer. And that put the special forces team to bed for a year or so. But eventually, from the medical corps, I, I transferred up to the air corps. And I was in training wing um, up in the air corps, which, which trains all the, the, the soldiers, trains all the recruits, trains all the airmen in basic, basic military training, basically. And uh, Dave used to work there before he went to SAR. And he took me for a flight in one of the Alouettes. And I went up and there was a lot of nap of the earth stuff. And I got back and he was all excited. And he was going, he was, you know, what do you think? What, what, what do you think about it? I went, ah, it's all right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> would, you, would you think you'd be into it? He says to me, he said, no, not really. I said, I want to do me NCO's course. I want to do me all weapons course. I want to get overseas with the UN. And, I have no interest in SAR. And when I joined the the, the medic the training uh, group up there, and my boss was a female female officer, a very nice lady called Paula O'Reilly. And she brought me in to interview me. She says, you're only here to do SAR, aren't you? I said, no, 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 ma'am. I said, no. I said, I'm here for training wing. I'm here to get me career courses, to get me weapons courses, to go overseas, all that type of stuff. She said, I've no interest in SAR. But she knew Dave quite well because Dave used to work in, in the training wing as well. So she says, all right, she said, no problems, Airman Carolyn, because I was an airman at the time. And she says, yeah, that's great. She says, you know, get you, if you stay here, you'll get all them. And then about a month later, she calls me into her office, you know. My office was beside hers. I was the company runner. I was, you know, I was, I was the, the, the clerk, the typist, the trainer. I was, I was a physical training instructor. So I was, I was, um, I was doing training with the, the people in the gym and stuff like that. So she shouts through the wall, Airman Carolyn, front and center. Oh, yes, ma'am. So in through our office, you know. Yes, ma'am, how can I help you? She says, sit down. So I sat down. She says, you're a cute one. I said, ma'am? She says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She says, she says, you told me you had no interest in Sarah. And she's a lieutenant, and I'm an airman. I'm sitting there looking at her going, I haven't got a clue what she's talking about. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Right? I'm going to listen to what she has to say. She says, look, she says, I have your application for Sarah here. She says, the Sarah selection course. She says, even though you told me you weren't here for Sarah, she said, I'd be very happy to sign this because I, I think you might be suited to it. She says, but if, 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 if you don't pass, she said, it's a very high failure rate there. She says, I would be more than happy to have you come back to this unit and do what you want to do, she says, because um, somebody you're, whatever, she said, I won't blow smoke in my own bone, but she says, she was, she was happy to have me back, right? So I said, yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So she signed it. She said, there you go. She said, remember, she says, if you, if you fail, you're coming back here. Nobody else is getting you. I said, yes, ma'am. So I stood up, stood to attention, turned around, walked out of the office and says, what has just happened, right? Because I never, I never filled out an application for him. So I'm sitting there and I'm going, that's coming around. To be, we, you had a tea break. The, the Defence Force sort of has a tea break, you know what I mean? And yeah. they, I think we call it a coffee break, break in America. So, coffee right? break, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, 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 tea, whatever. I'm a yeah, tea, tea guy. Coffee. What do you say? Yeah. I'm with you. It, it was at 11 o'clock in the day you went for tea break, right? Yeah. So Dave, Dave's head pops around the corner. He says hello to all the sergeants there that know him and that. And he goes, he goes, Keith, he says, he says, any news? I went, no, no news, Dave, you know. He said, no news? I said, no, no news. He says, you going for tea? I said, yeah. So as I was walking down, he said, no news today. 
I said, funny enough, I said, I said, I've been accepted on a SAR course I never applied for. And he punches me in the shoulder. He goes, he says, look, he says, I know you'd be great at it. He said, that's all I can do for you. I'm going to be an instructor on the course. So, so it, it'll be, it'll be Sarge and Carolyn and, and back to Erm and Carolyn again. Once you get the course, he says, he says, you've gotten it now. It's up to you. So I'm looking at him going, what? Yeah, you point, I didn't even want to do this. So, you look, you have to do, I have to do the physical test. I have to do the swim test. Yeah. Uh, a very comprehensive swim test. Very comprehensive physical test. The physical test alone was, was when I was staying fit and I just, I'd been back a couple of years after breaking my leg and I got, I got back to fitness, full fitness again. Very hard fitness test. Very hard swim test. Um, very hard, uh, they took it for a flight test to see, to see, you know, they basically sat you in an alouette and they threw you around the place and up in the air flying to make sure that you wouldn't lose your lunch, you know what I mean? You know, assimilating turbulence, you know, yeah. doing, um, doing all the rotations in the fields, you know, practice all the rotations in the fields and stuff like that. And then standing at the door, and part of your swim test was you stood at the door and you jumped out of the alouette and about 20 foot into the into the sea. And you did that twice and you winched out and um, you did jumps off bridges into rivers and swims, rescues, all sorts of mad stuff. But yeah, yeah. So I never applied for a SAR course, but when I went up to it and I started it, uh, I loved it. Yeah. I, I just, I loved it. it. It just got into my skin and I adapted to it and I took to it like a duck to water. It was, it, it just became like second nature to me you know winch up and became second nature to me the the, the the most clarifying of talk the most clear my head ever is and ever was and ever will be is that moment just as i let go of the aircraft no matter what aircraft i've ever been in just as i lose contact with the aircraft and i turn to go where i'm going yeah. my mind just goes zen yeah and it just focuses in and tunes into everything that's happening around me it's like i can hear things see things it's like the best rush I've ever had for control, and and that's the way I, I describe it to people, and that's that's what the, that that's what made me go back to search and rescue, just in search of that zen and that 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 level of focus, you know. You know that is a great like description of it, and I'm actually glad you said that because that just tells me what I'm feeling every time I go out the aircraft, hanging yeah. from the hook, whether it's a free fall, whether it's just hanging below the aircraft. There's there's something about it. And I actually, you know, I just finished a training not too long ago and in it, uh, it was a buddy of mine I hadn't seen in like 10 years. And as we're talking, he's like, you know, I've always respected you guys as swimmers, you know, you come in and we'll joke around. And then when it comes to go time, it's like, boop, you turn it on and you're like, okay, it's time to be serious. It's time to, time to turn this on. Let's focus, execute, be done. And then we can joke around again. That's that's it. You know, you, you know, you know, I'm a bit of a joker from from the <laughs> I, like, I like to have a bit of a joke and a bit of a laugh. But like when it comes to doing the job, yeah, I like I like a bit of a laugh in the helicopter as well. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little story of joking in the helicopter and then become a professional. A good buddy of mine, uh, probably one of my best buddies. Uh, we went through our SAR course together. He came from the Navy, from the Irish Navy to the Irish Air Corps. Derek Malloy is his name, and uh, we were in the. <laughs> We're in the S92, and the S92, the particular S92 we were in, had two floor straps at the door and one to the rear. Whereas generally the others only had two, right? So I had three, not two. So part of your, part of your pre-door opening is you check harnesses. Everyone's on harness, you know. Check clear to open the door to the pilots. They say if, if your harness is secure, clear to open the door. You open the door, doors open and secure, right? And you stand at the door then, and and you, you do your brief and you do whatever you've got to do, right? So I've done all that and. Uh, I opened the door and I'm standing at the door and uh, Dermot's standing behind me because he's my winch man of the day. He's, he's dual rated as well. And uh, <laughs> he, 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 he taps me on the head with the end of the floor strap. And I, I, I looked at the end of the floor strap and I'm thinking there's only two floor straps in the aircraft so I'm not secured. So I jump backwards and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sitting near, nearly in the winch man's seat and I'm looking for my floor strap and I feel, I feel that I'm connected, you know? Well, he's waving the third floor stuff at me. I mean, he's just to see what the look on my face. I'm back there. <laughs> I nearly, I have to tell you, I nearly crapped myself. I nearly had, I nearly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then we had to go and do, do, do a training cycle. And he was the winchman. So, so I had to do a training cycle with him, a full training cycle, put him onto the deck, put the high line down, the tagline high line, put the stretcher down, recover the tagline high line because there's nobody to maintain it. And then recover him in the stretcher. And then we had to swap around again and do the same thing. So we went from joking to professional, the blink of an eye. 
And yeah. that's, that, that's what we do. And you know, like, you're a rescue swimmer, right? You, US Coast Guard, you just go through your rescue swimmer program, your ASM program, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yep. correct. Okay. There you go through your ASM program and you become rescue swimmers. And um, here in Ireland, we're not, we're, we're not rescue swimmers, we're, we're winchmen. And we do swim in the water, but we don't do, we do all static deployments. We don't disconnect from the hook. So we can swim, but we stay static, stay, stay statically deployed. And um, that's just different. And different folks in Europe do different ways as well. Uh, we do static deployments and uh, they're all static deployments. Everything is static deployment. There, there are cases where people have come off the hook and um, to do jobs. Like I know people like uh, a, friend, a friend of mine, Alan Gallagher, came off the hook to swim to the back of the yacht, to get onto a yacht. And a friend of mine, Jim O'Neill, came off his hook to say that, uh, believe it or not, I think it was a five-year-old girl who'd been washed out to sea on a unicorn, and she was a mile and a half, two I'm miles sorry, off. a unicorn? Yeah. Like you know one of the you... inflatable unicorns? That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she was, she, was a, she was a mile and a half out on the west coast of Ireland, like rough seas. Uh, Headed to America. Was, Come on. Yeah, yeah, that's it. She was pedaling. <laughs> next, next, next stop, Alaska. You know, <laughs> and, and you rescue swimmer guys coming out together. But yeah, Jim, when, when, when Jim was going in together, it's just, just a small story about Jim. You'll probably have him at, on, on at some stage. But yeah, Jim disconnected off the hook together because she'd been blown off the unicorn. He wasn't going to get there quick enough. So you, now Jim's a, Jim's a very, very strong swimmer and yeah. um, um, extremely strong. Um, he's a, he's a, he's a, he swims master's competitions now because he's over 50. He won't mind me saying that. You know, he swims in the market. I, I won't tell him if you won't. No, no, no. <laughs> I know he listens to this in anyway, so hi, Jim. Uh, uh, <laughs> hey, Jim. Come on, Jimmy. I'm blowing smoke up your bum, Jim. Yeah, no, but, uh, he disconnected and he got he got the girl. Yeah, and he rescued her. And, and, and the heli tipped away and he was recovered by the lifeboat with the girl on his chest. You know, real real hero stuff, you know. Yeah. Real, real, real reward stuff, as I call it, you know. Um, if you're ever put forward for an award, it means you've done something stupid. <laughs> I should oh. not edit that bit out as well. Okay. Uh, no, um, yeah, no, it, it, it's just, yeah, we're not rescue swimmers, we're winch men. And, and, and I'm a member of EuroC, which is European Rescue Swimmers Association. And I was the, I was the, I was the country rep here. I'm very happy to be a member of EuroC. I think it's great for us. And although it's European Rescue Swimmers Association, as you know, it's open to the whole world now. You know, right. I've met people. I've met people and I've good friends with people and um, from Chile. And I don't want to leave anybody out. You know, with Chile, Argentina, America, uh, France, Germany, uh, Spain, oh, especially, all over. Yeah. Uh, you know, Australia, New Zealand. There's people in New Zealand there as well. Uh, South Korea. I'm in touch with a guy from South Korea. You know, yeah. uh, Mexico, um, all over the world, basically. So yeah. it's a world organization there. And we get together and we, we talk and we chew, we, 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 we chew, chew, chew the cud and we have a beer and we have a chat and we get serious lectures going and we do serious stuff when we have our RSMs. And that's that's good to see. But yeah, but like sometimes I think, you know, yeah, we're not rescue swimmers and we use guys are rescue swimmers and you use, you use do a different job. Um, same job, same risks. Well, you probably take a bit more risk than we do. You know, we just do. Rescue swimmers who disconnect from the book take a little bit more risk. But it's a calculated risk and that, that's what our job is all about. Yeah, so calculate, calculated risk, and sometimes so, you calculate risk, and sometimes uh, you know you're going to get hurt. Sometimes you know you, you know it's not going to go right. You may be on a on a on a hiding to nothing, but that's that's our job, and, and you do it. You know, yeah. we're, not, we're not we're not heroes. We're ordinary guys who put on the trousers one one leg at a time. Right. And we do our job. We love our job. We, we get paid. We get paid for it. We don't, we're not doing it voluntarily like some some people volunteer to do it. And uh, we put on our trousers one leg at a time. And we do our job. We all want to go home to our families at the end of the day. It doesn't always happen. But, you know, that's that's the job. That's, that's the job. Doing. And that's what we want. The discussion about coming on and off the hook as far as free swimming in the ocean, I, I enjoy this conversation. Um, I'm on everybody's side, as funny as that sounds, because I like being able to have the opportunity to disconnect when needed. And to use your buddy's case, Jimmy, he disconnected to go save the girl that got blown off the raft or off the unicorn. <laughs> that sounds so funny. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I, we practice in the U.S. Coast Guard the direct deployment method where you can stay connected to the hoist hook. Yeah. And it, it works brilliantly. Yeah. I like both. I like to have the option of both. That is me personally. And I feel that my training has 
given me the uh, positive side effect or, or whatever, however you want to phrase it, but that yeah, your, train, your train's giving you the tools to do that. You, you exactly. Your train to do that. You get right. those tools in your toolbox. I, I'm, I, I, I like both as well. I, I, I think if you have the option to do it, you should be have the option to do it. But your training should gear you towards that. Like I've watched videos of, of ASNs being trained. I've watched videos of, of rescue swimmers being trained around the world. And yeah, your training gives you that tool. It gives you that confidence to do it. Yeah. For us here, for me, could I be a rescue swimmer now at my age? 54 years of age, could I adapt to rescue swimming? I don't think so because I haven't been doing it since I was younger. Do you know what I mean? I haven't been right. conditioned. I, but, but I can swim. And I can swim. I can swim well enough, you know? Am I going to be yeah. swimming in 12-foot seas out in the mid-Atlantic? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not. Uh, but I'm in. I, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course. But yeah, I, 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 I don't knock it. I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking what, what, what the swimmers do. I have high respect for people who, who, who do free swimming. Really high respect is, you know? Um, do I think it's... Do I think it sets you above a, a, a winch man who doesn't disconnect? I think it does a small bit. I, I would, I would hold you felt a small, a small bit on a higher pedestal if you call it that than a winchman who, who only, only slightly, only slightly, slightly higher pedestal than a winchman who stays static for me. Um, but like, yeah, I, I'm a component of both, both styles. You know, I think if you, if you have the option there to do it, well, why not? But you have to be trained from the start, and you have to be competently really? trained in that that rescue swimming. You really do. You really have to be competently trained. You know. And, and there, there is a, a side of training that goes like water when you free swim to the hoist operator, as far as, you know, that, that whole dynamic too. Cause if I'm staying connected to the hook as a hoist operator or winchman, winch operator, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to maintain cable as, and not give too much, but not, you know, pull you and jerk you out of the water based on swells. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of dynamic, like moving parts in that whole world. And if he's disconnected, and my swimmer's in the water, and as I'm moving in, I like my my swimmer needs to help me and swim to the cable because okay, yeah, you know, yeah. and the, again, it's training. Just train it. If you're gonna okay. do it, train it. Yeah, train, 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 train. Get it wrong. Yep. Train until you can't get it wrong. You know, don't yep. train until you get it right. Train until you can't get it wrong. You know, that's that's something I think I heard somebody say in one of your casts there. Yeah, I took that away. A lot along with a lot of other stuff he said. Train till well, don't train till you get it right. You know, trains. trains, you can't get it wrong. Right. And um, I, I, I'm a big believer in, I am a big believer in this, is that um, you shouldn't be a winch operator unless you've been a winchman. I believe that. Because when you're a winch operator, when you've been a winchman or a rescue swimmer, it brings another dynamic to you. Because you know exactly what that winchman yeah. or what rescue swimmer is doing. You know what's going through their head. Well, you, yeah. you should know what's going through their head, especially if you're an experienced winchman. You should know what they're going to do. You should know what they're going to do next. Now, I'm not knocking the hoist operators out there who've never been rescue swimmers. And some of them do a very, very good job and very, very confident job. You know what I mean? But yeah. it's just my belief that the path into hoist operating should be true on the end of the workforce, you know? Or, you know, you should have some experience of being a winchman, a rescue swimmer, whatever you like to call it. And um, we'll call it winchman. Um, and, and over here in Ireland, even, even our females are called winchman. You know, yep. she, Sarah doesn't mind being called a winchman and anyone else who comes in, they'd be a winchman because that's in the manuals, you know what I mean? Yeah. And once it's in the manuals, you have to change your pattern. Changing your <laughs> pattern is dangerous, you know? You know, yeah. what are you going to call it? You know, you, I've been using the winchman's hair for checking the winchman's kit. Winchman's kit is good. Moving the winchman to the door. Winchman's at the door. Check clear to winch. Green lights inside, you're clear to winch. Checking the winchman's kit again. Thumbs up from the winchman. Put the winchman over the side. Winching out. Stress test is done. Taking them off his floor strap. Winching out, winching out, winching out, winching out, winching out. Good position, winch. It's winchman, winchman, winchman. It's 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 uh, a that's for the really case. good, by the way. It's like you've done it once or twice. Uh, only once or twice, I think, and practicing the mirror, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I started it. It doesn't sound like that in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> like oh, ooh, uh, uh, ooh, uh, how about higher? <laughs> Listen, what 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 we're on that? One of the best honors I I've ever had in my life, and I still get it every time I fly with people. One of the greatest things that anyone can ever do is put their life into your hands. Yeah. And um, when 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 I check my winchman's kit, and I'm a winchman as well, so it's the same for the winch operator when I go out the door. When I check my winchman's kit, and I get a thumbs up from the winchman, which is the last thing the winchman does before I put him out the door. Right. That's a huge honor. That that, that winchman is putting his life, his health, his future yep. in my hands. 
So he better be on top of my game. I better be at my A game. Because it's not only a winchman I'm putting out that door. It's Keith Carlin, married, two kids. Right. Future, wants to retire, wants to have a happy retirement. Well, I, I want to... I want to die an old man. I don't want to die a young witch hopper here. I want a young witch man. You know what I mean? I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to fade away slowly and be forgotten by everybody. You know what I mean? I don't want to be going out in a blaze of glory. But uh, that, that's the greatest, the greatest honour I've ever had was well, a thumbs up from a witch man. And, that's, and I don't think I'm ever going to get a better honour than that. Because that, no. guy is, uh, that guy or girl is putting their life into your hands. And, it, and as a witch, I know the pilots are flying the aircraft. But as a winch operator, you're the guy keeping that winchman safe. Yeah. And that's and, and to, to do that, I think you should have to be a winchman. I I love I have been truly blessed at the fact that I was able to go through rescue service school and now I'm a winchman, like or a hoist operator, winch operator. Yeah. I I am so happy the fact that I could get to that level and not only be at that level, but train it and teach it. And I I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's, it is definitely something to be said. And I think every pilot that's out there needs to get on the hoist hook, needs to ride the hoist hook. So they understand and know what we're doing yeah. in the back as a winchman yeah. hoist operator, as well as the guy that's actually on the hook. Like, that's, you, that's the yeah. way it was in the Air Corps. Yeah. In the yeah. Air Corps, all new pilots had to go out on the hoist hook. You had to do sort of a, 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 a compressed winchman's course. You know, you had to, you had to be winched clips. You had to get winched to the, to the decks, you know, they had to, they had to winch on the end of it. So they knew, yeah. they, they knew where a swinging cable was. They knew why we asked out for a walking pacing sometimes, you know, depending on what you're doing, yeah. it's a walking pace winch when you're, when you're flying in and out. And look, pilots are pilots. Pilots always want to fly, you know, like, um, they, they, they want to fly. And the pilots we get in SAR are generally, I'm, I know I'm going to piss off a lot of people here, but generally the pilots we get, helicopter pilots in SAR, or, or any of the, 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 the frontline service, like hands and stuff like that, I genuinely some of the best pilots you can get. You know what I mean? They're, Agreed. They don't, they don't go into these jobs because they're shrinking pilots. They, they are, they are A-type personalities. You know, a lot of them would be ex-military combat pilots and stuff like that. And you wouldn't know it with a lot of them, you know? Um, smooth pilots, you know, really guys who have done it, seen it, done it, um, but, but, but being there and have the T-shirt. But... Generally, the pilots that we get, whether they come from a military background or a civilian background, they, they're, they're just some of the best pilots that you can get in the helicopter world, you know? Yeah. So I've flown with some good people and I've flown with some bad people, you know? And, yeah. But I, you know what? I, I'll throw all of us under the bus and say I've flown with some good hoist operators and I've flown with some bad hoist operators. It, <laughs> it's, I, it's, ask my colleagues about me. They probably say he's a mediocre hoist operator. <laughs> I never said it was the best hopper I used to operate in the world. Yeah. Hopper, and I no. never will. Because I, I look up to some guys who are really, really good at my job. And I go, I would love to be that guy. Uh, you know, there's guys in their job. You, you could be you could be on the end of the hoist hook holding on to 25 people coming off a born and vessel that's sinking with people everywhere. And their partner would be, eh, Winchman, Winch, he's cleared the deck there now. He's got five passes <laughs> on. Winchman's on fire. Five passes <laughs> Clear back and left, back and left three, back and left two, back and left one. He's still on fire. Say, He's still on fire. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to dip him in the water just to stop the fire. The water. Yeah, there's 25 people in the water. 10 of them are on fire. The life raft is on fire. Yeah, uh, which one's approaching it? Just, just patting the top of which one's head, put the fire out, taking which one the casualties on board, you know? Yeah, you've got, you've got winch operators like that, you know? You've got a winch operator that quality, you know? Uh, and they don't get fuzzled and they, they, they look at things outside the box and different things. I learn. I'm learning all the time. In our job, Jason, if you're not learning, you know, you're, you're stagnant. If you're not learning every right. day, if you're, if you're, you're dead wood if you're not learning them with you. You know what I mean? You have to be learning every day. You know? yeah. Well, and we talk about it all the time, especially here on this podcast, is that there is no cookie cutter rescue. There's nothing, nothing is ever the same. Like we train the same way. So, and I, and when I say that, it's like, all right, we're going to do, like you're all your calls, uh, clear for the step, you know, clear for the door, uh, which operator is going out. For me, the rescue man's going out on deck, disconnecting, empty hook coming back in. You know, you're going through all these steps. And regardless of your terminology, this is what we're training. You train over and over and over to, to get that perfect, you know? Yeah. So you train until you can't mess it up. Yeah. When you get the job, you get the rescue, you get the call. That is all different all the time. But when you fall back to standards, it makes the rescue relatively yeah. Yeah, normal. We so. we we um 
I'll give you a little story. We launched out. We, we got a call one day. I was in Dublin base. I was up there on, on uh, OT overtime uh, covering because of a short for sickness. And we got a call for an e pair, right? You know, e pair, the emergency position. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pew, 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 pew. In Dublin, they're running the mill because there's loads of boats out around the coast. And there's a lot, like, so it's an e pair, right? We're going, it's an e pair going off, right? So we're all looking at each other. It doesn't slow us down many, but we got a kid on. I was the winch man, um, and we winch up and looks at the It's a knee pair of keepers. Yeah, okay, it's a knee pair. And as we lifted from from the base, we looked out to sea, and it was for the Irish sea. It was like a mill pond. It was flat. There wasn't wow. a ripple in the sea. I mean, it was like glass. So we're all looking at each other, going, "An knee pair. Somebody's dropped the knee pair overboard." <laughs> this is this is a joke. We're going to look for an e-pair in these conditions. So we're all having a laugh and I'm on the flare and I'm looking forward and we're looking, we're going getting to the position where the e-pair is and it's it's outside the shipping lane. So um we're looking. It's a routine car, e pair We're gonna find the e pair We'll we'll mark its location. One of the lifeboats might come out and get it, or even I might for the for the for the hell of it for the practice, go down and pick it out of the water, you know? Yeah. So then the pilot flying up front. Uh, he looks out and he goes, is that a marker boy there, Keith, in the distance? You know, I'm on the flare. I said, where is that? He goes, so I'm the now, it's 12 o'clock. Is that a marker boy? So I'm looking and I go, uh, no, that's a life raft. <laughs> oh, no. He goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, I've got oil and I've got debris in the water. So I go, okay, no, that's a life raft. And there's people in the life raft. Yeah, there's people in the life raft. So, We've gone, he says, okay, it's my target. You go through your bits and pieces then, right? So at that stage, the fear is stalled. I'm in my kit. I'm, I'm, get, I'm checking my kit because I'm going to recover these guys in the life raft. Uh, flat cam, Jason. Flat, I mean, glass cam. Never see it. Never, never see it. Flat cam on the other seat. And I'm looking at this and going, it's got a routine e pair find to, oh, you know, we're going to find it somewhere out of the border. One of the boats, one of the big boats transit and has gotten it wet or the yeah. antenna is broken or something like that. To taking three people out of a raft, two of them, two of them quite hypothermic. Uh, the, 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 the water was 10 degrees and, and uh, they were they were dressed for fishing, you know what I mean? And the oldest guy on the vessel who owned the vessel, um, he dragged the two young, this guy's in his 60s, and he dragged the two younger guys in their 20s into the life raft and he hadn't got a life jacket. He had no life jacket on him. And what happened to them was they were storing pots in the back of the, the, the vessel. And it was it was a half decker. They were storing pots in the back of the vessel. And somehow they got the center of balance wrong. And the ball tilted, took on water, and then it took a sway. And you know when water gathers, it's yeah. all right when it's changes of a flat on the boat. But yeah. when it gathers into a corner, that's what happened. Gathered into the corner and the boat sank within about four minutes Holy in flat smack. flat calm seas. And they were they were there. They didn't even know their e pair was working. They had their e pair been with them. And um, they were outside the shipping lanes. They were a good distance off the coast, a good distance from life uh, from the lifeboats as well. So we 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 went and we we winched the tree them off the off the the, 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 the life raft. So that's she there's no cookie, as you said, there's no cookie cutter rescue. We're going right. and saying it's an e pair, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll give you I'll give you another example of an e pair of a job where you don't think it's going to be a uh, going to work out. We were in Waterford one day and uh we got a call saying that uh, there was two guys rolling from America to Ireland and they were overdue. And there was a knee pair going off in the area where um, they close to where they gave the last radio call. So we, it was in air patch. It wasn't in Shannon's patch. Down way, way off Kerry. Um, extremes of our, of, our, of our range. So we flew to Castletown Bear and Cork, refueled in Castletown Bear and Cork and tipped off the coast um, off the coast of Kerry, great views of Skellig Michael as, as we flew past Skellig Michael. We're basically out in a straight line out looking for this e pair. So we got out to the area where the e pair was and uh, where the signal was supposedly coming from. We, we couldn't pick it up. Um, it'd been picked up by a satellite and uh, we couldn't pick it up. And we, we went to the Dan and Point and we're having a debate and we're talking about fuel, how much fuel we have left. We're, we're extreme, extreme, extreme range of, of the, the 92 we are, you know. It's yeah. daytime, early, early daytime. So we've we no top cover with us. We don't, we don't need top cover. Um, I think Shannon were on, were on standby to be a chase aircraft for us. So we're out there. And we sat on the pilot and looking at each other and we're thinking about, well, what are we going to do? So well, what we do is we go to the point where, the Dallin point, we do a little search at the Dallin point and we, we do an expanding 
box search there. So yep. I said, yeah, okay, Martin, that's fine. That's no problem. All, all, all the media in the aircraft. So we're there. We're, I'm looking out. I'm the winch man. Oh, sorry, I'm the winch up. So I'm in the winch up seat on the right-hand side, on the starboard side of the aircraft. Uh, the winch man, Tommy Gannon, is on the left-hand side. He's on the floor. And I'm looking. And I'm saying, what type, of, what type of boat are you in, Martin? You know, again, you tell me. He said, it's a white hull boat. And I'm looking out to sea, and all you can see is white horses everywhere, you know? <laughs> so I'm looking at him going, if, if the area out here said it's a needle in a haystack, man, it's a needle in a haystack. And we're having a bit of laugh with it, you know? A knee pair. I'm looking for a knee pair about, I can't even remember what distance we were at. I think it was, a, uh, it was a good distance off, extreme range. Uh, a knee pair. I said, how are we going to find an e pair in all of this, man? I said, look at it. I said, how are we going to find the boat, let alone the e pair? So I'm looking out the right hand side and I see this, the, the sun is glinting on the on, on the waves and everything. We're, we're, we're up at a thousand feet. I see this little glint. And I'm looking at it and going, mm. so what I do with one of them cases, I point my finger and I hold my finger out the window so I don't lose it, you know? Yeah. I get a glint again. I say, man, I think I have something out here. I said, the three o'clock. I said, I don't know what it is. I said, it's it's glinting. It could be just sea shine. And I said, I said, can you come right? So he comes right, and Tommy comes up and looks over his shoulder. He looks, so Tommy gets onto it. I says, yeah, it's definitely, not, it's definitely man-made, I said. I said, it could be the heat curve. And it's just a light on the top of the heat curve flashing, you know, just bing, yeah. bing, a little flash, little flash, little, like a pinprick light. So Tommy gets it on the, the flare, and it's the heat curve. So we fly over to the heat curve, and we're looking at the heat curve, and we're looking down at it. Open the door. Yeah, that's the heat curve. Open the door. Looking down at the heat curve. The heat curve is broken free, and we're looking around. We're looking for debris. We're looking for anything in the water. Right. Nothing. Nothing in the water. Nothing anywhere. So then we'd, we'd had top cover come over to us from the air car, and they said they spotted something five miles from where we were. So we said, okay, there's the u pair. And Mark was saying, but the way the tide is, Keith, I, I don't think that, I don't think they're up there. I said, Mark, look, we go up and take a look. So we closed up. Mark, the point for the for the pair. We went up to where the down point where where we, they, they thought they'd seen something. And we've done it, you know, we're, we're quite tight on fuel at this stage. So we've done an expanding search and uh, nothing found. So we decided amongst ourselves, among the crew, let's go back to where the e-pair was and do a search a mile either side of the e-pair. Mile upwind, updrift, and a mile downwind, downdrift yep. from the e-pair. So we decided, we went back. We, called at the air car, told him we, there was nothing seen there that we gave a good search. And we're coming, we were about, I'd say we 20 minutes fuel left on scene and search in here. 30 minutes? Uh, 20, 20. Oh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two zero fuel for, for search and before we go bingo fuel to get back to Kerry Airport. Yep. yep. Um, so it's, we'll do this. We'll do, we'll do it. We'll do it. Um, we won't do an expanded box search. We'll do a, a, a spoil search. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll go out and we'll, it's like a flower search. I can't remember what it's called. You do. You do a search around the circuit. You go out half a mile, come back out half a mile, come back. Always coming through your central garden point. Yeah. So it's it's a version of a, of a search. I can't remember what it's called. So it's really, you know, we only did it the other night. I just can't remember. Um, so on the second leg of that, Martin looks out and he goes, oh, I think I have something yellow in the water. And I'm, I'm going, Where? He says, down there, Keith, in the two o'clock, there's something yellow in the water. So Martin is very experienced. He's an ex-Royal Navy guy. He, he, he's been in the Falklands. He's... Oh, hugely experienced. So I said to him, okay. I said, fly to it, Martin. You you have it in your sight. It's your target. See, let's go see what it is. So uh, as we're tipping over to it, I noticed it's a life jacket. It's the boat up toward the end of the boat. And the two guys are clinging onto the boat. Um, oh, onto, oh. onto the hull of the boat. Only one has a life jacket on it. So I said, Jesus, Martin, God bless your eyesight. This is, this, let's go get them, you know? Let's do our checks. Now, everyone's excited because we found these two guys needle in a haystack in the middle of the Irish Sea, off the Irish coast, or in the middle of the Atlantic, off the Irish coast, with white caps, e Uh So it comes to the, when you're saying there's no cookie cutter, we, we go over, we, we, do our, we, do our, we do our approaches, we do, all, we do all the checks we have to do, open the door, Tommy's beside me, waving down the two guys, two guys are clinged onto the hull of the vessel. I can't tell you. You could actually see them clinging onto it. One with a life raft, or one with a life vest on, one with no life vest on. So we go through our brief, and I say, does, does this, they have a stabilizing fin on the end of the, on the, end of the, the, the boat, which is about, it's about 12 foot high, right? Oh, wow. And it's Big. sharp. Okay. Yeah. 
Belfo High stabilizing fin on this rowboat, right? Yeah. So and that clings quite close to it, and there's debris everywhere in the water around it, everywhere. So I say to Tommy, I say, Tommy, Tommy, look, what I'm going to do is we we'll take the guy without the life jacket first. So we we done our brief. We, we talked to the boys, and uh, got Tommy onto the back onto the onto the the, the boat just behind you, man. And yep. Tommy slips on and goes into the water. He's he's connected. So I, I had enough slack out. Tommy goes into the water. Now the vessel is about still six foot high. The vessel, the waves are about the waves are about eight feet, rolling eight feet waves. So Tommy's there. So I winch Tommy out of the water. I put him back in the same position again. He falls off the other side. <laughs> I put him back in the same position again. On the vessel, all the time on the vessel, all the time yeah. just behind this guy. And the guys are clinging on like they are clinging on for dear life. So Tommy slips off again. So I'm teabagging on either side of this this boat. So I say, this, this isn't working, Martin. I said, hold on a second. I'm going to bring Tommy back up. So I winch Tommy back up into the aircraft, plug him in and say, Tommy, what's, what, what's the story? He goes, Keith, he says, it must have a resin on it because I keep slipping off it. He said, every time I get onto it, it's, it just keeps sliding off it. And Martin says, yeah, yeah, it's probably treated with a resin, you know, an anti-slip resin to allow it to slide you. Yeah. I said, right, well, 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 we, have to, we have to do this, Tommy. We have to think outside the box here. So Tommy said, I'll tell you what we do. There's not in the manual, but this is what we're going to do. And he says, eh, you bring me down. I'll put me in the water just beside him. I'll give your man the strap. He'll put the strap on him. I'll hold the strap. Yeah. Okay. And um, once I give you the nod, which is, uh, it's a nod, right? It's yeah. Nod. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yes. Bring me yeah. up. Yeah. Me in, I'll come in. And as I come in, I'll connect them up onto the hook. I'll be taken clear. I said, okay, Tommy. I said, uh, it's not standard. I said, but it's the only way we're going to get this dude off. So Tommy, I put Tommy down in the water beside the vessel. He throws the hook, the, the, the yoke up to your man. Your man puts it on himself, throws the toggle. He's holding the bit out. He's holding the, the, the carabiner out. Yeah. Uh, Tommy gives me the nod. I slide Tommy up the side of the vessel, connects on, which is totally, you know, we don't do this shit. Yeah. This, this stuff, sorry, this stuff. <laughs> ah, you're good. So Tommy, t- Tommy gets your man, the first guy clear. Um, he's an Irish guy. Get him into the aircraft, push him to the back of the aircraft. Martin is saying, um, we're bingo fuel. Near, we're near bingo fuel at this stage. And you uh, still got one more guy down there. Yeah, you still got the guy out there with the oh. life jacket. So Tommy knows he's not going to get this guy into the aircraft with the life jacket on. So he's in the water. Uh, your man can't get the strap on him with the life jacket on. He can't really understand him because he's a, he's a, I think he's a French Canadian. He speaks French. Uh, or he was a French guy. His family had financed this, 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 this roll across the, the coast. They, 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 were, they, were in, they were in 200 miles of, of, of Ireland, as far as I know, when, when the incident happened to them, or 150 miles, something like that, anyway, off the Clare coast. And wow. um, what happened then was Tommy, Tommy, your man couldn't get the strap on him with the life jacket. So Tommy said, what am I going to do here? I could see Tommy looking. I knew exactly what he was going to do. He's going to take the guy into the water with him. That's what yep. he's going to do. Yep. So Tommy, even while there was stuff around there, Tommy took the guy into the water with him, took off his life jacket, Stropped him, had to strop, he had, had him had him gripped by one hand, stripped the, the life jacket off him. Always keeping Tommy as clear as I could of the stuff. Uh, put the strop on him, recovered him in, in he went, uh, into the back of the aircraft. The four of us, are, they're there in the back of the aircraft, but they don't talk to the two guys. They don't realize how lucky they are, right? They don't realize how close they've come to dying. They were hours and hours and hours clinging onto the boat. What happened was they become complacent. They left one of the hatches undogged and um, they were in rough seas. The French guy was the Irish guy was sleeping below decks. Um, I think it was it the French guy sleeping below decks, having a sleep, and the Irish guy was rolling with the life jacket on, or vice versa. And they taken on water, and then they flipped upside down. So the the E-pair came away from the vessel. They managed to make it onto the, the and they were afraid to move on the hull of the vessel because they'd slipped off loads of times into the water. Yeah, multiple times into the water. I've never seen two guys eat so much in my life. We had we had <laughs> we, we had a we, we bring pot noodles with us in hot water because it was a long range job. Yeah. So they ate all the pot noodles. They ate all the chocolate in the aircraft. Dro- and it's that's an example of a non cookie cutter job. You know, we're going looking for these guys. We have a hope and hell of finding them in air in air, in air mines, right? We're optimistic, but we find the e pair. We're going okay. We found the e pair. Maybe now your chance. They're looking good to find them. We find them. Now we've got to get them off it. Non standard lifts for the two of them. Yeah. And back, almost bingo fuel back. So there is no cookie cutter job. I know you always say that, but I agree with that totally, you know. What a story. Oh my God. Well done. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, what a good idea, too. Like, hey, throw oh, this oh, on. Totally. And 
on your way. Tommy's experience. Yeah, yeah, Tommy's experience. Tommy's yeah. huge. Tommy's 20 odd years doing SAR, winch man, winch operator, Martin Rainer, pilot, ears flying, um, Sea Kings, um, 61s, 92s, and um, myself, a few years doing SAR, a few years doing bits and pieces, and a, and a very young, uh, new co pilot who was hopefully taking all this in and learning from this. But yeah, and, and that was it. That was a huge, that was, that was a crew job. You know, that was every yeah. single person was on point. Every single person was switched on. And do, do, you know, do you know what made that job successful, Jason? Look, pure look. <laughs> and I mean, look, <laughs> the look of the Irish, the look of whatever. I like talking. the York Irish. Come on. We were lucky. We were so lucky. 90% of that job was luck. It was pure luck finding the e and then pure luck finding those two guys. And they're walking this air to this day, and they just don't know how lucky they are. They probably thought we just flew straight to them and rescued them. It wasn't like that at all. <laughs> we, were, we were so lucky to find them. And a lot of rescues are like that, as you know. Yeah. 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 Sometimes oh, yeah. you're a liar. Like you, I think you tell the story of the girl was on who, um, who fell walking and broke her back in her pelvis. Yes. She was lucky. She was oh, lucky yeah. she had to be prepared. She made a little tent with her, with her map and she had her signal up and the guys were searching for her. She was lucky. Yeah, Claire Nelson. Lucky. Yeah, that's her. Yeah, yeah. Amazing cool. story. Yeah, 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 yeah. For anyone who hasn't read it, yeah, uh, listen to it. Go back to it and read it. Yeah, very, very good story. Yeah. 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 Gosh. Well, shit. Thanks for sharing that one. That's <laughs> that's something that would stand out for me too. Like, good lord. Yeah. No, look, that, that's that. Uh, Martin's retired now. Um, Martin retired last year, and that's that, he, he said that that's one that always stick with him was that was that job, you know. Yeah. Um, off, off the coast. It was a good job. You know, we came home. Um, we dumped the two guys in Kerry Airports. They, they were they were only slightly like the thermic, very slightly. Once we took their, their the kid off and got them dry and got them fed, like we walked off the aircraft in the lashes of rain in Kerry Airport. And the family were driving to meet them. The family went from being told they're missing to being told they're missing for a lot of hours and chances aren't looking good for them to being told that how oh, long the helicopter is seeing them. The helicopter has them. They're coming back to Kerry. And uh the, 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 those two guys and that they recovered the boat they salvaged the boat the boat was worth over a million dollars a million euros or something like that so they oh sent the salvage team God. and salvaged the boat yeah we, we marked the position of the boat and we sent the salvage team out to get the boat wow the boat. yeah save people yeah. and property well done sir yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what look I'm, I'm working pre-hospital um, as a pre-hospital clinician, about 25 years, right? Um, 35 years? Yeah. yeah. I was a frontline paramedic. In Dublin Fire Brigade, we supplied a frontline ambulance, the 999 ambulance, or your, 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 your what's your, what's the 911? 911. Ambulance. You guys have triple yeah. nine, right? 999. Yeah, we got triple nine or 112. So yeah. Dublin Fire Brigade had a combined EMS fire and rescue service. And uh, I was a frontline paramedic on an ambulance and the fire engines, because you know, fire engines were dispatched to EMS calls as well. And we were all paramedics, all trained paramedics, and um, the advanced paramedics now. And like, oh, you got it. I got a fabulous grounding in the medical car. Um, I got another course when I joined SAR. Um, I did a, a paramedics course through the National Ambulance Service when I was in search and rescue with the Air Corps. And then I did a second paramedic course with Dublin Fire Brigade um, when I joined Dublin Fire Brigade. Um, so I got a huge ground. But the experience I got in Dublin Fire Brigade, like we'd be doing, I was in a very busy station. I ended up in my career in a very busy station. We'd be doing 25. Um, ambulance cases in a 16 hour night, you know. Holy cow! Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, everything uh, we a plethora of everything, you know. We in our area, we had we, all the I was listening to the guys talking there. We 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 had the old ladies at night, we had the nursing homes, we had the stabbings, we had the shootings, we had the car accidents. We er, 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 we did heavy rescue as well. Like, um, I'm a trained uh swift water rescue technician, I trained yeah. in rescue training. Um, I'm a trained rescue from height technician and supervisor when I was in the fire brigade. And um, rescue from height is known from height it's confined spaces as well. Right. Uh, heavy, what you call over there, heavy rescue. We we the heavy rescue the vehicle on air base as well on air station as well. And we had two fire engines. We the we the ET, which is the heavy rescue, and we we the district officer, which is, you, you'd call him um, the chief over there, and okay. the battalion chief. Oh all, yeah, all, all, yeah, battalion chief. And where I worked was, I walked to my fire station. 10 minutes from my house was my fire station. So I walked into work every day. So I was dealing with all my community. But yeah, 
Yeah, I've, 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 I've got a huge amount of experience of cardiac arrests, broken legs, broken ankles from football, you know, broken noses, cuts and with knives and at home and, you know, huge medical stuff like medical, like diabetic, diabetic, diabetic coma, um, COPD, uh, all the, all the normal is running the mill stuff. Not, you know, EMS stuff is, 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 90% of run of the mill cause, and, right. you know, drug alcohol cases. And, and then you've got 10% of what, you know, the Gucci calls are called, right? the shootings, the, yeah. the stabbing, the big RTAs where you're cutting people out of cars and you've got, you've got multiple casualties, you've got multiple fatalities, uh, yeah. uh, big fires uh, where you've got um, people born, you know. It's, it's they're, they're, uh, EMS people are strange, you know. They're the type of calls we want to be doing, even though we don't want to be doing them. We want right. the run of the mill calls, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard it mentions BS calls in, in the states. You know what I mean? You, you turn up for for Granny Carolyn, and it's your tour time that day to go out to her and take her to hospital. Like you know what I mean? <laughs> or it's your tour time that week. She's a frequent flyer. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah, you get, you get them all, but yeah. And in the fire brigade, I've I've been I've been attacked with bottles. I've been attacked with pellets. We have been at Dublin Fire Brigade. Is we're we're, we're in Northern, um, we're, we're we're in a city environment, so it has its problems. Um, I've been attacked with a sword. I've been nearly stabbed. I've been attacked with a poisonous Jeez, oh man, dude! I've nearly I've nearly been shot. I pulled up outside. We, we I'll give you this one by Dublin Fire Brigade. Um, we took this little old lady who was having a she she was suffering from angina, and we took her in. Um, from a from a place in I won't tell you the name of the place, but I don't want to disparage the, the, the area in, in Dublin. But we took her from that case and we were listening to another case going on in the radio and there'd been a shooting in the same place, um a drug shooting in the same place. And they were going to the same hospital as us. So we pulled up and I got this little old lady in the back of the ambulance. So I've got her 12 lead on and I've got I've done all the stuff I have to do. I have her settled, having a laugh, I having a chat with her. And uh, normally when you pull up outside the ED, your, your driver would get out and open the back doors for you, you know? So yeah. there was nothing, nothing for me. I'm sitting there. The back door is open and there's a guy standing there, all dressed in black, black balaclava. And he had um, a Glock in his hand and he's pointing the Glock into the back of the, the ambulance. And I just looked at him. And you're, the old woman looked at him. And I said, sorry, mate. I said, the ambulance you want hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> <He's all laughs> <off>. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. He ran off. So the driver then came around and said, Who opened the door? I said, eh, There's a guy with a gun after opening the door. And he said, No way. I said, Yeah. And uh, he looked at the old woman. The old woman says, Yeah. So he brought, <laughs> he brought her into the A&E. And of course, the, the tree ring circus arrived at the guy who was shot. Right? So the, the police were in, the armed police were in. The ambulance arrived, the motor, the, the fire engine that backed them up arrived. The place is bedlam of people all over the place. They, they bring him into the resource. They're trying to resource this guy. So I'm standing there with, with the old lady waiting for the triage and the rest of the country. And uh, I said to the driver, hold on now, let's go over and get this guard. So I went over, a plain clothes guard, gun on his hip. <clears throat> I tipped him on the shoulder and said, yeah. he was on his phone. He said, I said, can I have a word with you, you know? And you're a cop, like, you know, the cops and so he looks at me and goes, hey, which in a minute, which in a minute? He's on his phone. He goes, okay, no problem. So I went back to the lady, handed over my, my casualty, and uh, went down to the ambulance, tidying up the ambulance, and said to the guy with me, said, I'm going to go back in and just set, mention to somebody what happened, you know? Yeah. So I went back into the same guard again and tipped him on the shoulder, the same cop. We call them guards. The guard E here, guard of yep. shit, call it, guard is the piece. So I tipped him on the shoulder and said, can I have a worship? He goes, yeah, yeah. He says, well, you know, can you make it quick? I'm busy. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem, sir. I said, when we pulled up just ahead of you, as I said, there's a guy opened the back door and he said, pointed a gun into the back of the ambulance. And he goes, what? I says, yeah. He said, when did this happen? I said, about 25 minutes ago. He goes, ah, why didn't you tell me? I said, I tried to tell you. He tipped you in the shower. I asked you. You told me you were busy. Go away. So that's what I did. I went away. I came back to you now. I'm telling you now. He goes, wait, where did this happen? Is there cameras outside? Get the security. Get the things. He said, which way did he go? What was he dressed in? I said, oh, I said to him, oh, now you're interested. Not the fact that he pointed a weapon at it. It's just now you might be able to catch the dude. Is that it? So <laughs> I had a bit of attitude with him because, uh, uh, you know, I was annoyed. This guy had a point of gun at me and nobody gave a shit. Excuse my yeah. language. Um, so I gave the description and they, they tried to find him. But they didn't find him. But, but in the ambulance that would have pulled up, there would have been the guy that they shot, a guard, and maybe two, three firemen. So it was my thinking that maybe if your man was going to shoot the guy, he's going to shoot everyone in the back of the ambulance. Mm -hmm. 
Right. You know? So that, that, that's why I got pissed off and reminded me this to me. Did you, they, they didn't catch him. Yeah, but and the old, little old lady, she didn't, she didn't bat an eyelid, Jason. She just sat there and looked at your man as well. And I looked at her and she looked at me and I said, sorry, mate, the amateurs you're looking for is behind us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. That's was, hilarious. Look, that was exceptional. That was, that was, that was, that, that was exceptional. But, yeah, I've, 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 I've had it. I've had a great career. Uh, everything, everything I've done, I've loved. Uh, the Defence Force, to me, was a sports club. I yeah. played. I did a lot. I, I, I was, I played soccer quite a lot. I was captain of the Defence Force soccer team for five years. Eastern Command Air Corps soccer team. I was, I was a all army gymnast, part of the gymnastics display team for five years. Uh, orienteering. I was all army orienteering champion with the team that I was with. Uh, any sport you could think of, tiddly winks, didn't matter. I'd be there trying to do it, you know. Uh, overseas, when I was over in Lebanon, with uh, I had a trip to Lebanon with the UN. I was captain of the soccer team over there, the Irish soccer team, um, beaten by the Ghanaians in the Intercommunion final. I missed the penalty, which still sticks with me. <laughs> 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 I that you know what? Day. Shouldn't have missed a penalty shot. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> I, 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 I took my boots off and everything. I didn't want to do it, but as the captain of the team, nobody else to do it, so I had to put my boots back on and I missed. And the Ghanaians won. Fair play to them. Um, oh. Well, no, it's not fair play to them. I'll carry that to my grave. I will carry that to my grave. Absolutely and utterly. That's one thing. That's one disappointment that I have. The sticks in my craw is that I never got that gold medal in Lebanon. You know? But uh, look, um, I know I'm after me talking about I'm just going to hold you up for another couple of minutes. Um, one thing that I am big into, one thing that, that I take very, very seriously is critical incident stress management and peer-to-peer support. Uh, yeah, Sam. Absolutely. I can't as, agree more. Yeah, as first responders, we should be taking care of ourselves. Um, we should be taking care of our own mental health. I got involved in critical incident stress management when I was in the Air Corps after we had a fatal dolphin crash in Tremor where we lost four crew members. God rest our souls. Um, Paddy, Mick, uh, Dave and Noel. Um, after that then, we started... SISM was in its infancy in the world and in its infancy in the Defence Forces. And three of us from, from Search and Rescue were sent down on the first SISM course uh, to be run by the Defence Forces. And we were three other ranks. I know you have a rank structure in, 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 the, in the Coast Guard, but we, like, you had two airmen and a flight sergeant and everybody else were officers. You know, yeah. we were the first, first, first other ranks to do the course. And we had to break some barriers down there as well when you're we doing the course. But I was a true believer in SISM. And um, I stayed connected to SISM in the Defence Forces. And then I went to the Fire Brigade. And Dublin Fire Brigade had SISM in its infancy. So I was in, I joined the team there when it was in its infancy. And I was, I carried one of our response phones for three years, uh, helping me colleagues. We rolled it out in Dublin Fire Brigade. And um, I was doing it unofficially in CHC. They, they, they had a version of it, but it, 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 they didn't follow up on it. Um, so I was doing it unofficially with other people. And then they brought in cheer. And then they went to SISM peer-to-peer support. Well, like for, for us as, as first responders, our mental health is very important. Agreed. Uh, talking to peers, I, I'm a huge believer in peer-to-peer support. I, I believe it saves people's lives. I believe it saves people's mental health. Talking to somebody who's been there, done that, has the T-shirt, and has probably made it through to the far side if they're talking to you, is very, very important. And as first responders, we should be talking to people. We're, look, we're all macho dudes. We're all, and I'm talking about the girls as well as the guys here. We're all A-type personalities. We all right. want to think we're bulletproof. We all want to think we can't get hurt. We all want to think that our mental health is, is, is tip top, you know? And hopefully that's the way a lot of the people's careers go. That they, they go through their careers and they're able to deal with things. But, and it's a but, if you're not able to deal with things, you have to be able to open up to people. You have to speak to people. You don't bottle this stuff up inside. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Nope. It stays with you. It stays in your head. And, and mental health is as important as physical health. In fact, your physical health doesn't stop at your head. It goes above your head, into your head, and into your mental health. So if you've got a strong mind, you'll have a strong body. If you've got a strong body, it'll follow that you, you'll have a strong mind as well if you can get your mind balanced. So if anybody's out there and anybody's suffering or anybody's thinking of those stuff, you're not a wimp. You know, men cry. I've cried. I've cried many times in my career. Um, I, 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 I work with some of the most serious guys in, in the fire brigade and, and in the army. And yeah, they, they, they're affected 
as well by stuff that happened to them over the years. And yes, they cry. Of course they cry. Uh, there's nothing wrong with crying. Um, crying is a good release of stress and it's a good release of, of emotions, you know. Um, you're not a sissy if you cry. You're not a pussy. You're not, you're not an asshole. You're not a, a person who can't suck it up and take it. Because right. you know what? You're not supposed to suck it up and take it. You have a duty of care to yourself and your, and your, your organization has a duty of care to, to, to put you out of your job when you retire <clears throat> in the same physical and mental health as you go into it. And it's up to you first to say, do you know what? My mental health is as important as my fitness as, as my physical health. So if, if, if I'm getting a bit fat, I'm going to increase me, me cardio, I'm going to reduce me, 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 um, my, my calories, and I'm going to do more hit sessions, I'm going to do whatever that. So if, if I'm thinking about things or dwelling on things or stuff isn't sitting right in my head, what, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to talk to my peer-to-peer supporter, my SISM um, team, my EAP, my psychoanalyst, my psychotherapist, yeah. where am I going to talk to my wife? Most of us talk to our wives first, our partners, uh, our husbands, uh, yep. depending on, 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 on your, your, your sexual ideation and um, whatever your situation is. You're going to talk to them first. But you, what you've got to do is you've got to recognize that talk therapy is good. It yeah. works. I've seen it work. I've been doing it for over 20 years. And I'm telling you, telling you it's all out there now. If you take nothing else from this conversation, take nothing else from what, I, what, I, what I've said, um, nothing at all. Take, 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 take this from me. Talking to people works. It saves lives. It relieves pressure. It relieves stress. I am a huge believer in that. You don't have to go into it. It's not a psychotherapy session. It's just talking about how you feel. And right. I guarantee you, if that person is a peer-to-peer supporter, they've probably gone through some of that in their lives as well. It's a pity people can't see the video here of, of the look on my face when I'm talking about this because I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true, true believer in SISM and peer-to-peer support. If, if anybody's out there suffering, guys, anybody, and I mean anybody, any part of the world, at any time, and you can't talk to anybody, talk to me. Yeah, me too. My, 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 my phone number is 087-780-5410. You put 00353 in front of that, and that's my phone number. That's my phone number, and I don't mind it being out there on the internet. Anybody at any stage wants to speak to me, that's my phone number. If you can't get anybody else, you, you don't have a system, you don't know who to talk to, there you go. You've yeah. got this little Irish leprechaun, Keith Carroll, and <laughs> at the far side of the line, waiting to talk to you. Okay, and I mean that. I mean that. I, I am available yeah. to talk to anybody at any stage, guys. You have to take care of your mental health as well as your physical health, and I'm a big, strong, strong believer in that. Really, hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. And I, I will say the same thing for me. If anybody out there needs somebody to talk to, send me a message. Let me know, and I'll connect to you like as soon as I can. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I've got that. yeah. I'm, I'm on yeah. WhatsApp. I'm on WhatsApp. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, although I told Jason I don't do media. I don't do much of Instagram. WhatsApp is Facebook. I, I'm, I'm sort of like a Facebook addict. Um, I, I'm not on all the time, but I'm, I'm on Facebook quite a bit. I put a, I put a lot of stuff up on Facebook. I stay connected with guys around the world on Facebook. So, yeah. So, I'm on Facebook, Keith Patrick Carolyn. Um, Instagram is KP Carolyn as well, I think it is. And WhatsApp is Keith Patrick Carolyn. Um, C-A-R-O-L-A. If you want to spell it of, of Carolyn. Uh, yeah. So, you can get me anyway. you want. Email. My email is, is keycarolyn944 at gmail.com. And that's my email. So any, 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 any guys want to contact me? There's so many ways to contact me. And I, I guarantee you I will get back to you. you know? Yeah, you me know, too. Oh, you know, what you know, is, I'll tell you what, you saying all this, this is actually one of the reasons that you and I have had to delay our conversation here because so the accident report for 116 came out and you and I actually had a one of our, our, the date set up, the time and date. And when that incident came out or the report came out, we delayed because you specifically said to me, I'm going to be here for all my people. And I'm like, if you need anything, let me know. Yeah. And that's, I, yeah, I'm, we, I'm with we you. Responded, we responded by sending peer to peer supporters to all the bases to be there for two days. Yeah. Um, I'm headed, I'm headed, I'm headed CHC, Crew of Vincent, uh, peer to peer support to team on the team leader. And um, that's just a title. I was just an ordinary guy, and um, we just I just direct the guy. I just asked the guys um, on the team at the moment um, to come along with me for two years and, and get it set up. And once it's set up, on that, I'll, be, I, I'll step away. But yeah, we responded by sending. Um, it, it, the system is all about having a plan as well. If something happens, you have to react to it. And um, there's proactive and reactive system. Um, I believe in both of them. I believe if somebody has an incident, I've no problems picking the phone up to them and saying, "Hey, Jason, how you doing? I believe you had a bad case there today." Because I'm yeah. the ISAR. 
you know, how are you feeling? How's everything? Not straight away. Maybe the next day or the day after, you know. How are yeah. you feeling? How's everything going with you? You know, just the usual chat. Get, get a yeah. chat going. We're a small group of people here in Ireland. So so we all know each other. I, 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 I was in the military with a lot of the guys um, that are in CAC at the moment, you know. We came through the same training system. We all served together at some stage. Most of the military guys did. And the National Army Service guys came through a system where there's system as well. And we all know each other. So I have no problems ringing any of the guys and saying, how are you doing? It's Keith here. What's the story with you? You did a job there. You know, not a good job. You know, how are you feeling? Or, it was a great job. But, you know, I believe this happened, that that happened, you know. And then the chat starts, you know. If you want to talk to me, you talk to me. If you don't, I get one of the other team to approach them in different ways. And yeah. there's ways to approach them. But we, we responded to the, and for fairness, to the manager in CAC that we have at the moment, he's very, he's very system orientated, peer to peer support orientated. And we deployed, we deployed team members to, to the base for two days, and we have team members on call twenty four hours a day to, to respond to people, and um, if they if they have situations, and, and those team members, whether they're off duty or on duty, um, it's volunteers. We're all volunteers. We're not getting paid for this. We're doing it in their own time, um, as is most system and peer to peer support. We're there for you. We're there for us. We're there for everybody. Um, and, and and we 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 we're there. We make contact with you. If we will ring. We'll ring in Ireland, we'll ring in anyway. We were proactive that way if a bad case comes up. You might get a call from somebody saying, Listen, Jason Quinn there had a bad job down in Shannon uh, two days ago. He'd give you the goods of it and say, you might give him a bell. I say, Yeah, no problem. So yeah, get if I can't do it, I'll get somebody to do it. So so we yeah. probably slips through the through the gaps, you know. We we want to be proactive. Yeah. If I explain that we, I don't know whether to explain it right or not, Jason. You know? No, you did very much so. And, and I'm I'm a key component of actually extending that even further of and I just, I say this loosely, but like a month or two months later, making that same phone call. Hey, you know, the adrenaline rush has gone down. The the all the interviews or media and all that stuff kind of goes away and and everybody has forgotten about it. Well, that still resonates inside of us quite often and months down the line. And I, you know, we talked to uh Sam Fielder. And for him, it, it, last, it was like a year, a buildup of an entire year. And he had to do stuff to flip his mind a year later. So, yeah, firm believer. We, we, we follow up as well. You know, there's, there's, it's part of it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a growing, it's a growing, um, what would you call it? Um, it's, it's, it's been adopted by a lot of places now, peer to peer support. And, and everyone's learning. And as we go along, we learn. Yeah. And, uh, Touching base with people a month, two months, three months down the road, follow up is good. You know, you, you can't just abandon people. You know, you can't just initially talk to them and then. But we see we're so small, our unit is so small that that I'd meet you maybe three months down the line. And anyway, do you know what I mean? Or yeah. one of the other peer to peer supporters who's at your base would 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 be on duty with you. You might be on duty with you for two months because the way the roster goes, and then they're on duty with you and they're touching base, just saying, "Hey, hey, Queenie, how are you how are you keeping? How's everything? You know, I believe yeah. Keith is going to touch you." Yeah. You're all good, yeah. And then the chats, and then you're on base, and the chat starts. And it might not be that. It might be. It might be four months down the line. I might just ring you up and say, "Hey, Quinny, how you doing? It's Keith here. Remember the incident you had there a couple of months ago? How are you getting on? How are you feeling? How's everything? How's life going with you? You know, how's how's your wife? You know, because we we know each other's wives and yeah. kids. And stuff like that. You know, how how is like Keith? How's Deborah? Oh, Deborah's good. How's Ashley and Carmen? Yeah, they're all good. Yeah. Look, I'm affected by it as much as everybody else is. You know, I, I, right. I, I need peer to peer support as well. And um, I have my ways to deal with my stress, and I, I know my stressors, and I, I, I've identified my ways. And I'm going to tell you my way of dealing with stress. <laughs> don't laugh at me, right? Because this is when I'm highly stressed. This is I'll, how I'll I try. I'm going to try not to laugh at you right I now. Know, I don't even know what's coming, but I'm going to try not to laugh at you. I know you won't laugh. I know you won't. Laugh. <laughs> but the way I deal with my stress is I feed the ducks in my local park. Do you if really? I'm, oh man, that's if, awesome. If I'm totally stressed out, I will take the recycling vegetables out of the bin in the, into a bag. I don't feed them bread because bread is bad for them. I read that bread, you can don't feed bread to the ducks because it's bad for the digestive system. If you take bits of um, cabbage and uh, green stuff and stuff that you normally eat off the bottom of, of, of the, you know, the sh- peels off carrots and stuff like that. Yeah. So I do, I, I get great solace about going up to my local park here in Tynan Park. There's huge, huge lakes. And I walk around the park and I sit there and I feed individual ducks, just roll up bits of stuff to them and throw them to the individual ducks. And, and I can lose my mind doing that. Just just me and the ducks. And, that, and me and the ducks is how I deal with my stress. That is awesome. But... And it, uh, look, everyone has to find their own de-stressors. And yeah. de-stressors. But that, 
that's if I'm really highly stressed, that's what I do. I just go up to the park and I lose myself for an hour or so. And uh, and it works. It works for me. It works. It works for me. It does. That's awesome, uh, man. I I I might. Uh, there's no ducks here, but I'll tell you. Like it, there's like for me, my big stress reliever is is working out. Like I, I love being in the gym and getting a good sweat on. And you know, when I leave there, I, I feel like just relaxed and you know. I've seen some of the guys. So, like uh, I won't mention names, but I've seen some of the guys from Eurosa. You know, they they work out hard. You know, they, I think I think it's I think it's ingrained in the and a lot of them would be swimmers. A lot of them would be free swimmers as well. You know, I think yeah. it's ingrained into a lot of free swimmers. You know that you know you have to have the body beautiful. You know, <laughs> I, I want that. I, I want that. Look, where, where where's the bar? I think it's over there somewhere. Yeah. You know, showing off the biceps. I'm know? just feeling a little like. Oh. <laughs> I think I just uh, I just I just stretch into the air and show off my lats and my my, my biceps and my trapezius muscles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel uh, so good. Yeah. What size shirt do you wear? Extra yeah, medium. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah, yeah. You take your sun shirt off. Really, you're stretching. You're gonna rip it. But I just you know get these guys. Yeah, these buff guys, you know, all real muscly dudes, and you've got a ten-year-old boy's ch- top on that's just boom, 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 muscle all over the place. But yeah, no, yeah, a lot of a lot of guys do, Jason. A lot of guys work out. I I started running marathons only about ten years ago. You know, I've run a I've run a good few marathons, ten k's, half marathons. I hated running in the military. I hated it revenge. Yeah. But, but all sports. I played all sports, but I hated running. And I got into marathons for for a charity, and I've run I've run a few marathons, uh, a couple of half marathons. I'm looking at maybe um, uh, trying some triathlons or so because I like cycling. And a, a lot of us guys do have that stress relief working out in the gym, yeah. and it's good it's good that you have it. You know, you like you're in good shape. You know, there's other guys out there that muscles like all over the place. Me, I have a dad bod. You know, I don't have a six pack. <laughs> I, I, I have a keg. I have a keg instead of a six pack. That's my. <laughs> <laughs> it's like dead sexy. Too. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I, I like the Guinness too much. You know, I mean, that's, I like the Guinness too much. But, uh, well, yeah. you know, you know how much Guinness I have to drink when I come see you guys because it's going to be all the way around. <laughs> you're going to be, you, you'll be like an alcoholic when you get to Ireland. If you ever get to Ireland, you know what I mean. You, I'm, you'll be going I'm okay with that. Is that weird? <laughs> your, your liver will be crying, going, "Jason, please, go back to the Middle East, from no alcohol. Please, take me back to somewhere safe. Take me to be safe, please." Uh. <laughs> I have to go back into my zen, back to the gym, yeah. back to the zen. <laughs> but yes, you know, like, it, like even talking about uh, just working out, like when I get into the pool and I just start swimming laps, or you, or you hit the beach and you just swim the beach, and it's it's just you get in a zen and you just it's it's my relaxing time. It's exactly what you're talking about when you're feeding ducks. It's it's a zen. I, so. I, I can swim, but I wasn't a great swimmer, Jason. And I didn't get this Zen bit. I, did, I, I never got the Zen bit of running. My wife can run and she forgets about everything. But um, Good for her. I hate I just, it. I, I want, hate I, running. I, I, yeah, I, wanted, I, wanted, I, I really wanted to pass the rescue swimmers test in the rescue swimmers meeting there in 2020. So I put a lot of time in in the pool, in one of our local pools. I didn't tell anybody this. So, so all the Erosa guys would be going, oh, he was training for it. <laughs> I wanted to play for it. I put in a lot of time. 25 meter pool, one of the local pools, and I was putting in a lot of swimming, and uh, I hated it, hated it with a vengeance. It was the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. It was swimming 25 lengths, three strokes, three, three strokes, three, three strokes, three, touch the wall, turn, go back again, back again. <laughs> it was me. And, and I started off, I started off small. I started off doing 100 meter swims, you know, um, and yeah. just, just plodding along. Get up after 100 meters and go, oh, my God, I am so bored out of my head. I have to do another couple of 100 meters here. And it was a battle with myself, but I kept with it. And eventually, I got up to a good distance. And I was, I was, I was, I was sticking out the lengths, you know. I was, I, was, I was doing a good few lengths. I was trying some speed stuff, and I was going to get coaching um, to improve my swimming because I really wanted to pass the, the swimmer's test in, in 2020, you know. But, uh, yeah, I got that eventually, that. The rhythm of the stroke and the swim and just it just sort of lulled you in, you know. I get why you, I get why rescue swimmers and swimmers get that now, yeah. you know. I never got that running and I'll never get that running. Running will always be a trudge to me, even though I can do it. But swimming and and because of COVID over here, the, the pools have been closed for nearly two years, you know. Oh, bummer. So I was trying, I was trying sea swimming, but sea swimming, 
you have your wetsuit on over here because it's so 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 cold. So even during the summer, you have your wetsuit on. The tree yeah. meal off you have your wetsuit, your swim hat, huh? your goggles on. You have your floaty behind you, your tow boy. You yeah. know, it's 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 not the same as swimming in the pool. I, I much prefer to swim in a heated pool. To tell you the yeah. truth. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or I get, I get, I get what you get. I get, yeah. I get how, how I was arrested as well. And you know, ASM school looks awesome. It really does. It looks. Oh, it was a, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, like yeah. physically uh, and mentally, just because of the demanding side of it in every aspect. You're like, oh, wow. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and I'm very appreciative of it now. It's one of those things like you're going through it and you're like, this sucks. <laughs> But when you're when you're done, and then all of a sudden you have a case or two or three, and you're like, "Oh yeah, okay, that all makes sense." You know, you know you can survive that. So when you feel that pain, that the the burn and whatever you're going through from school, you're like, "Oh yeah, I I had this already. I I know I can survive it and continue on." So yeah, yeah, uh, that's it. Look, training that your your training is awesome. It really is, um, and I know a lot of the guys train to the sort of same standard around the rose, the, the free swimmers and the rescue swimmers. That's great to see. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's great to see all, as I, as I said earlier on, we're all doing the same job. We're all out there to do the same thing. Yep. You know, we're not, out, we're not out there for the glory or the medals or the, the, the press or the media. We're out there to do a job that that we're actually, uh, I'm going to blow smoke up every single person's arse out there who, who does it. That we're actually quite good at. If yeah. you look at it, we're actually quite good at our job. You know? <laughs> We're actually, I think so. I I think we're pretty good at what we do. Even 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 in my mediocrity, I'm quite good at my job. You know, my mediocrity good in my job. You know, but it, we're we're good at our job, and and that's reflected in in the successful outcomes. And I'm not yeah. talking about saving people. I'm talking about us getting home to our yeah. families. And we we don't doubt the casualty. Look, I've heard something mentioned there uh, on one of your podcasts. Somebody said it, and it's pretty true. You know, that it's their bad day, not your bad day. Right. You know, not a casualty. Yeah, you you're not a casualty. It's it's they're having the bad day. Don't let their bad day become your bad day. Right. You know. So so yeah. Have I had cases where I've gone to a thing and turned it down? Said I'm not doing it. As a winchman, I've been sitting at the door one time. I said no, I'm not going. That's it. I'm not putting myself in that much danger down there. Let yeah. them steam a bit towards shore. We we give them a little while. We come back in the morning when it looks a bit different, maybe you know. Right. And as a winch operator, I've thrown a job away as a winch operator because I couldn't put my winchman in that danger because the people on the deck. They weren't doing what they should have been doing, you know. And I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to expose me, me which man to the danger for the case that we were going to, you know. So, so yeah, let them steam into shore. Eh, it's it's forty miles or fifty nautical miles for them. Yeah. The dude has a broken arm. Stabilize his broken arm. Give him some painkillers and let's get home, you know. So, right. so, so we've got to think about ourselves as well, you know. Uh, don't let don't let their bad day become your bad day, you know. That's. But I went off point there. Sorry, I'm rambling now. Ah, no, no, it's, it's <laughs> like it's a it's a great way to finish this. <laughs> it's uh, you know what, yeah, like bringing this all in like together and between schism and you know making the right decisions, uh, buddy. I, you and I are on the exact same page. So we are all doing this around the world, and I love the fact that you know like everybody has been willing to come on here and tell their stories because they're all pretty similar. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you listen to them. And, and like, I, I've listened to a couple of them and, uh, you know, I, I looked at my team. You know, I could be that. I, I, I could be you if I was born in the States, Jason. You could be me if you were born in Ireland. You know yeah. what I mean? I yeah. could be, if I was a pilot, I could be one of the pilots there in, in with California Highway Patrol or, you know, one of the, one of the other guys that, that you've had on one of the other girls you've had on, you know? Yeah, we're all very similar in 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 what we say and our attitudes. Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Our attitudes, okay. <laughs> and, uh, there. That that was just a take rewind for anyone who's listening, right? Ball, yeah, right? yeah. Uh, in our attitudes to, to things and how we do things, you know. I'm I, I'm an I'm an ordinary guy. I'm, I like what I didn't say at the start is I come from a working class background in Dublin. I come from an area that would be socially deprived. My father was a soldier. He, he served for 43 years in the Irish Defence Force. Uh, he served in Congo twice. He served in Cyprus. He was in the Sinai, as far as I know, as well. Um, he served overseas. My brother is a soldier and still a soldier. He's a very proud of my own, too. He's a corporal in the medical corps. He's got he's got over 24, 25 years, I think it is now. Wow, in the good for Defence him. Forces. Maybe even more. 
and he's got six trips to Lebanon. He was in Lebanon when, for two great sorots when the Israelis rolled through so sort of Lebanon. He's been bombed, shot at. He's he, he's done stuff where he should have gotten medals for, but it was just considered run of the mill medical corps stuff, which it wasn't. You know, yeah. this happens to a lot of people. They're very proud of him. I am. Uh, he he done a great job. And my, my I, I I have five sisters and three brothers. We we're a big Irish family, you know. Um, uh, we always say that there's no television in my house. My father and mother had to entertain themselves somehow. <laughs> <laughs> We had it. Oh, we had that poor. I mean, we had a TV, but we, Irish families at them days. But the, the street that I lived on, like a small family in the street I lived on, was was four, or five kids. You know, we had yeah. a really great childhood. I live in Crumlin. Crumlin's uh, what you probably call the, the the suburbs. It's in the suburbs of Dublin. I, I can walk to the city centre of Dublin from my house. It's three miles, so I can walk in. And nice. but, it's a, it's a, but it's a working class area. You know. It's, that what you'd call blue collar, you know, uh, a lot of the people would have been working class dudes, you know, like my father, and um, would have been security guards, you know, uh, all sorts of jobs, had their own uh, trucks, coal men, uh, milkmen, oh, oh, normal, ordinary jobs, you know, right? And that's where I came from, that was my background. And I'd never, I, I always knew I was going to go into the army, I always knew it, I always knew I was going to be a soldier, I just had it in me. It's if I tra- trace them back through my through my life, um, through my family tree, there's always been military in my family. So I knew I was going to be a soldier. My father, uh, I I didn't have the attitude when I went into the army, and it wasn't reverse psychology because I asked him afterwards. Um, my father said to me when I joined up the army, he said, he says, he says, he said, I hate to tell you this, Keith. He said, but I don't think you're going to make it. He says, he says, you just haven't got the attitude for it, you know? Because I was a bit, <laughs> I was a bit faulty. I was a bit. I was a bit sort of, not wild, but, you know, I knew my own mind. I knew my own mind. Um, I didn't suffer fools easily, and I didn't take orders very easily either, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is probably not a great thing when you're going into the military. But, and it wasn't it wasn't very psychology, because I asked him afterwards, after me training, I said, you really honestly thought I wasn't going to do it. He says, I really honestly thought you couldn't do it. Now, I've got to tell you, but I thrived in the Defence Force. Absolutely thrived in the Defence Force. I learned to say yes or no, sir, three bags full, sir, how high do you want me to jump, how far do you want me to run, how many press right. do you need, what do you need me to do, you need me to carry this pack up that mountain, kill that guy, come back, into the truck and go home. I tried in that type of environment, really, really did. <laughs> but then I went to saving lives because I decided then, when I finished my basic military training where I trying to kill, 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 I didn't want to kill people. I wanted right. to save their lives. I probably killed more people as an EMS. And I've ever done it. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Keith. Dr. Fubilator doesn't stop. That doesn't start your heart, boys. That stops your heart. Don't talk to you. Oops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we won't talk about that. We won't talk about that. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm looking forward to meeting as many people from, from the frontline service as I can. I love meeting EMS guys. I love meeting firemen. I love meeting rescue swimmers, I love the winch operators, pilots, yeah. volunteers, a big believer in volunteer groups, like people who give up their time to do stuff. Um, all, all, all people, anybody involved in frontline service, I have time for them all, every single one of them, no matter who you are. Cops, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a great friend who's a cop in the States. She, she's an artist. She painted this picture for me. See nice. Picture? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. She was, she was I met her at a Patrick's Day Parade over here in Ireland. Um, she's a she was a Long Beach cop uh, in California. She lives in Texarkana now in Texas. Uh, she's a good friend of mine, and um, we've got loads of friends um, from the Fire Department New York. Uh, uh, people who were there at 9-11. Uh, I was selected for by Dublin City Council to march in the Patrick's Day Parade after 9-11 in in solidarity with our FDMOI brothers and everybody else who who was lost in in the Twin Towers. And I was proud to to march and represent Dublin Fire Brigade over there. Um, I played for the Dublin Fire Brigade Gaelic football team against the Fire Department New York football team many, many times. I've actually played Gaelic football for the Fire Department and New York team three times. I've, I've represented the Fire Department New York. Uh, I'm very proud to do so. And, and I've got friends for life from the Fire Department New York. Uh, Mike Riley, you know who you are. Uh, Billy Nolan. Uh, Billy was there at 9-11. Dennis McCool. Dennis. Uh, Eddie Bowles. Sean Fitz. Uh, lots of different guys from the New York, you know, Barry Royley, uh, nice. all, all, all the guys, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I love everything to do with EMS, and I, 
I love everything to do with uh, rescue. I love everything to do with blue lights, flashing lights, coloured lights, trucks, anything like that, cops, anything. You can, military. It's all it's all my life, and it's. Do you know what? I, when I do eventually depart this mortal coil, hopefully, hopefully, somebody can just look back and say, do you know what? He did it all right. <laughs> That's what I want. That's all. I, he did it all right. He did, he did it all right. right. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Keith, I'll tell you what. I think you're doing it all right. I'll tell you. You're doing it all right, my friend. I think you're doing all right as well. <laughs> so, boom, fist bump. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Quinn and Carlin mutual uh, watch appreciation society. We're I love it. Hey, we're going to start our own society. It's yeah, just you and me. I'm okay with it. Say, Jason, you're doing a great job. You know, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Keith, you're doing an amazing job. Come on, keep doing it. Keep, right. oh, keep going. Oh, Keith, I cannot thank you enough for coming on, sharing all these stories and just your information. Uh, and buddy, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. You're welcome. Uh, I'll, I'll catch up with you later because we're going we're gonna to keep this going. And, and I'm buying you a beer as soon as I see you. A good tall yeah. Guinness. Yeah. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Go. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page, at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember... When that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.